Let's talk about the overall global macro outlook and uh, the risks that are in the system uh, with the first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, David Lipton. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Good to be with so you. So on the stage, I just heard your speech. You talked about now is the time to address global vulnerabilities and risks. Where do you see the global risks heading into 2018 right now? Well, right now I'd say that there are upside and downside risks and that those are balanced. But I want to stress that there are risks. Um, first, to be... Uh, uh, positive. There are upside risks. Uh, we don't know uh, what's uh, the strength of this recovery. It's been somewhat surprising on the upside so far. So You're we, saying it's going from strength to strength, the global economy right now. The global now. economy seems to be uh, strengthening and broadening, and uh, that's good news. And it may be that uh, there's some, while this is a cyclical recovery and unemployment rates, say, in the United States have gone remarkably low, uh, the unemployment rate in Europe remains uh, somewhat elevated, so there may be some further room to run. That would be the good news. At the same time, I think we have to be aware of downside risks. It's possible that inflation rears its head. It's possible that... Some hope so. Well, some hope so. I hope uh, not. Uh, I hope that inflation will gradually move back to targets, but not overshoot and uh, uh, lead, leave a, a, a reason for uh, uh, central banks to step on the brakes. But there is also the risk that uh, capital markets participants who've been very positive, uh, who've been uh, take, willing to take risks, have been channeling capital to emerging market countries, be, become somewhat more nervous. It's possible that financial conditions tighten, and that leads to a greater response on the part of the capital markets. Um, it's possible that geopolitical uh, tensions could cause uh, protectionism on the one hand or some security conflicts on the other. So I think we need, we need to be aware of the risks. But bottom line, this is uh, an important cyclical global recovery. It's a good time, as uh, Christine Lagarde has been saying, to fix the roof while the sun is shining. That applies very broadly. I hope this is a year of opportunity. Is that what China is doing with this deleveraging campaign, which is likely to intensify in 2018 by most accounts? I mean, some say this will knock off a few points of uh, growth, but at the same time, is this the, the time to tackle those issues, the debt-to-GDP ratio that has soared? This is the time, and after all, Last April, the leadership decided to elevate financial stability as a national objective alongside of growth. And for the rest of last year, the uh, central bank and the regulators and supervisors have, in fact, taken important steps to fix the problems that were arising within the financial system, the complexity of institutions, the complexity of lending operations across institutions. Um, I think it surprised everyone, including the markets, that they were able to make important strides to contain that without sacrificing growth. They even have been able to lower the growth rate of credit somewhat without sacrificing growth. And I think that my reading of market reaction is that uh, this has impressed the markets. We are not seeing the external pressures on China that we were seeing. We're not seeing reserves declining. We're seeing them, if anything, are rising. Now, of course, there's more to be done. The Chinese have to bring credit growth down to uh, uh, grow less rapidly than the economy, yes. or else credit will continue to be too big relative to the economy. But you've got to say the verdict so far is that what they've done has been useful and that they're pointed in the right direction. There was some chatter last week uh, some from some Chinese officials, maybe backtracked a little bit, that maybe China is going to backtrack from buying U.S. Treasuries. What kind of impact would that be? How do you read it? I don't know what to make of those reports. Uh, there were reports, there were denials. So I won't pass judgment on that. You know, I think that, uh, I hope that economic actions and policies are basically based on economic considerations. China has, in fact, been a leader not just in reform at home, but in uh, uh, supporting uh, globalization and international cooperation, and I hope that that will continue. Now, what uh, impact do you see from the Fed rate increases we're likely to get, uh, three of them? When does that start biting in this part of the world? We've had one major central bank already raise interest rates, but again, they have a bit of a ceiling. I'm talking about South Korea, they have a bit of a ceiling because the growth trajectory and also inflation doesn't seem to be rearing uh, its head. So far, the Fed has done what it said it was going to do. Their policy change has been state dependent. So when the economy is strengthening, 
they normalize. And I hope that they're, I hope the normalization, the uh, recovery continues to be um, a healthy one. And so the normalization can be a healthy one. If that happens, the net effect on most of the rest of the world will be positive because what's most important is a strong U.S. economy that will help the rest of the world. You now, you know, yes, it's entirely possible that something gets out of whack. Um, we don't see that. But, but I, certainly uh, other countries would be vulnerable if for some reason there were a tightening of financial conditions, uh, if there was a need for the Fed to accelerate normalization, or if uh, capital market sentiment merely changed, surely um, uh, the effects would be uh, quite broad, broadly felt, especially in the emerging market world, including here in Asia, if capital market sentiment led to a retrenchment of capital flows, because so far uh, capital flows have been supportive of uh, stability and growth right. in emerging market countries. And stock markets are not the economy, but it, the stock markets are off to a pretty uh, hot start. Uh, is there a point where you start to think that this is getting overheating? Look, I have no particular view about any particular asset price. Asset prices go up, they go yep. down. We, we do look for uh, vulnerabilities, and our global financial stability uh, report goes into great length about, um, and, and we, we, we will be making some comments about this, these set of this set of risks in our World Economic Outlook update next week coming out of Davos. But um, right now, while we see some vulnerabilities, including debt, rising debt in Asia, whether it's corporate debt in some com countries, household debt in others, sovereign debt in others, um, we don't see uh, this as uh, something that is uh, uh, dominant in the baseline scenario. We see these as risks, things that should be looked after and contained. Does the U.S. economic outlook get a new review from you, given the tax cut, its fiscal yeah. stimulus, but we're already at uh, you know, very full employment? Yeah. Well, we'll uh, put out the details on this along uh, with our global assessment in the World Economic Outlook. But needless to say, we believe that the tax cut will provide some measure of support for a few years in the U.S. economy. Of course, and that comes because, the corp mainly because the corporate tax rate cut will affect investment and the temporary expensing of investment spending will affect investment, and those two things will be supportive. Now, it is, as you suggest, very hard to gauge how close the U.S. is to, to having no more slack. Right. Um, we've been surprised so far in seeing that there was still some room to run. We believe that the uh, corporate investment strengthening will provide some small uh, or modest increases uh, for a while, and we will be uh, uh, adding that to our assessment of the overall picture quickly, when we make this update. Quickly, what kind of impact do you see from what many say is an unsynchronized balance sheet reductions at central banks? You have, of course, the, the Fed going one way, the ECB, we don't have a time frame, and Japan, no, no such plans. I think it's important that normalization is rooted in each um, central bank's economic situation. Right. And so it, it has to be asynchronized if economic recovery is asynchronized. The UK and the US are in some sense Voice. further ahead because their economies are in a different part of the cycle. Um, Japan and the ECB, both in different positions from each other, are not yet, uh, they're, beginning to they're beginning to talk about regularizing balance sheets, but not yet about interest rate action. And that makes sense because of the situations that they're in. That's good news. It's good news that the central banks are tailoring their policies to the state of their recoveries. I think that it, that will be not only best for them, but it will be best for uh, the global economy as well.